Let's turn the screen over to you. So fellow panelists and audience, uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to participate in the panel discussion on a very vital subject. I would like to thank Concerts for providing me the opportunity to share some thoughts on uh, South South cooperation and uh, climate diplomacy, which of course is of utmost relevance in the current situation globally, regionally, and nationally. So uh, let me just say that South-South and Triangular cooperation has assumed importance for combating climate change. I think this has been illustrated by the earlier speaker also. Climate has also emerged as a core subject for statecraft and diplomacy. As one paper puts it, uh, foreign policy is climate policy. Therefore, clubbing the two together reflects the need of the present times. The global situation on combating climate change does not look promising. I think a point that was also made by the previous speaker. The wedge between the developed and the developing countries seems to have widened due to several factors, and these factors were elaborated also by the previous speaker. With the disruptions caused by three years of coronavirus pandemic and lately the war in Europe, resulting in energy has resulted in energy and food shortages. Uh, the world is in an economic stress. Uh, more importantly, given the extreme weather uh, conditions and changing patterns of climate conditions, quest for climate justice is becoming stronger. Uh, <clears throat> regrettably, geopolitics is once again driving the environment-related responses. The will for collective action, solidarity, and commitment on at least the principle that the developed world could take the responsibility and assist the developing countries on adaptation and mitigation seems to have weakened. In the last few months, parts of Asia and Africa have been inundated due to the unprecedented rainfall and floods. And I think this happened in Sudan. The survival livelihoods and food security issues for many communities are in a precarious situation. The impacts are compounded by glacial melt, and this is particularly relevant in the case of Pakistan, affecting the mountain communities and those living in the drained areas, as well as sea level rises, disrupting the age old habitats, both for human and wildlife. The island countries are particularly concerned about the physical survival of the states as the fear of submerging of the island states present a real threat. For them, uh, the task of adaptation, mitigation, and potential transition becomes even more problematic due to resource constraint, lack of expertise, and non availability of the requisite technology. During the last several decades, the perspectives on security also have changed. They are undergone a change. Its widened concept places an equal emphasis on risk that impairs socio political and socio economic stability. These risks, more importantly, pose an exist existential threat to the planet, its environment, ecosystem, and bios biosphere. Consequently, Comprehensive security considers climate change and the, re the related risk to human security as vital areas of concern. <clears throat> At the international level, the United Nations has acknowledged that climate change increases vulnerability, threatens food security and human health, negates development, induces migration and competition for natural resources, 
and could result in loss of land, causing permanent displacement, and in some cases, making people stateless. These conditions can lead to conflict. A widely held view is that the multi dimensional climate related security risk must be seen from the overall lens of peace and security. Among the issues identified under the rubric of climate induced security risk, conflict and violence has been highlighted as a threat having far reaching consequences. Scarcity of resources, in particular water and food, results in migration and people, as already said, moving to safer areas and greener, greener pastures. The shift to urban areas has a bearing on the crime rate and criminal networks start operating, burdening the state law enforcement apparatus and <coughs> complex and adds complexity to the governing strategies. In some countries, militias have posed a serious problem, making the state structures weak. It leads to the creation of circumstances where regional conflict complex provides a ground for interstate conflict in situation. It is generally observed that the multiple <clears throat> and multifaceted effects of climate change accentuate where there are pre existing challenges in social, economic, environmental, and other areas at different levels. <clears throat> Such conditions make policy formulation and response mechanism more complex. The exp experts therefore suggest an integrated approach within the context of identified threats as a solution. Such an approach assumes greater significance when dealing with communities and regions that suffer from persistent poverty, hunger, and disease, resource scarcity, changing weather patterns, and virtually non existent infrastructure. Within the discourse of multi dimensional climate related security risk, economic conditions and well being of individuals, communities, states, and local community requires urgent relevance. The economic disruptions at the metro level can have negative impact on growth, trade, transportation, supply chains, and international financial stability. The global food shortage, shortage is spiraling into economic scale of development challenges and adversely affecting the achievement of a sustainable development works mm -hmm. as per the targets. Um, as has been witnessed in the last one year or so, the frequency of wildfires, floods, erratic weather patterns, melting of glaciers, and sea level rise has increased the level of risk confronted by the world. The prospecting, debilitating impacts erode the resilience and capacity to comprehensively deal with the consequences. The colossal damage caused due to the recent multiple climate related effects in Pakistan is a recent point. Pakistan contributes, I think this uh, has been stated earlier on also, less than 1%, uh, and so do most countries in Africa, to global emissions. But Pakistan is the sixth, eighth most affected country. Because of the unprecedented rainfall this monsoon, 65 to 75% more intense, 33 million people are severely at risk who have lost their assets, livelihoods, and livestock. One third of the country is underwater, though uh, in some places it has started receding, but there's a forecast that there's going to be no rainfall, so it remains pretty unpredictable. People in these areas have been constrained to leave the damaged and inundated homes and take temporary refuge at high places. The damage to agriculture and Sudi Arun's standing crops has virtually destroyed the food basket of Pakistan. Due to lack of hygiene and consequent health and medical hazard, along with hunger, disease is posing a severe challenge for the people and the authorities as well. UNICEF has estimated that 16 million children have been hit by the floods and we are in urgent need of care and attention. The melting of glaciers in the north and sea level rise in the south impose a double whammy. The United Nations Secretary General in recently visited Pakistan to express solidarity with the government and people of Pakistan 
termed what he saw as effects of monsoon steroids. According to the word weather attribution, uh, this is basically uh, an organization, an international meteorological group, there is convincing evidence to support the argument that climate change exacerbated the recent devastating floods in Pakistan. The National Disaster Management Authority of Pakistan has also reinforced the fact that the unprecedented floods triggered by reform monsoon rains and glacial melt in modern areas have severely damaged Pakistan in different ways. The effects of what has happened this year and as predicted would, would become a regular uh, feature in the future, possibly corrective measures are not taken, will have great long-term impact on the country. The fragility and development deficit in certain regions would likely pose challenges nationally, regionally, and globally within the framework of multi-dynamic climate-related security risk. And I think um, up climate change, it is generally said that could upend civilizations, and I think this was mentioned uh, in a different way by the previous speaker. Pakistan has mobilized all its resources at the government level. Military is carrying out the biggest rescue and relief operation. The people and various NGOs are making exceptional efforts in reaching out to the people. International community has also stepped in a, in a big way in augmenting the efforts of the, by the foreign governments and INGOs and UN organizations. However, the task of resettling those displays and their rehabilitation will be a long-term and arduous undertaking. The initial loss has been estimated at US dollars 30 billion. This is where the role of the existing climate mitigation structures and metric mechanisms will be crucial. Calls for climate justice are growing requests for reparation and compensation. The developing countries need to put forward a $100 billion annual contribution as promised in the Paris Agreement. In partnership with Pakistan, technical support for putting up a smart, integrated approach would be helpful. The climate disaster in Pakistan can become, and the response can become a model case study that would help in identifying the risk, devising a sound policy and workable strategies. Experts in the field should, uh, perhaps could guide Pakistan in preparing and implementing a viable adaptation and mitigation plan. This indeed is a situation of multi dimensional climate related security needs. Serious thoughts should be given to the increasing consequences of climate change and the survival of the habitable planet. In this background, backdrop, the countries of the South need to prove their knowledge, benefiting also from the indigenous and traditional ways of protect, protecting against extreme weather conditions and for dealing with climate disasters. Sharing of research, development, and innovation, both in relation to South South and tribal cooperation with the country. And I think Comsats probably have a good take on this in this regard. If workable transition solutions are to be employed, then technology transfer remains pivotal, which could be country and region specific and grounded in the local context. Um, I think uh, um, I will end here and once again thank Pomsets. So thank you, Ambassador Fozia Nisri. Uh, I would like to request Ms. Yufal Lee to deliver her insights on the subject. She is Senior Advisor at South Sector. She has diverse experience of 25 years in the area of development finance, business, trade, and economics. Ms. Lee, I would like to request you to take the platform. Ms. Lee, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I apologize that uh, the South Center Executive Director, uh, Dr. Korea, could not attend this meeting. 
uh, I myself visited Comsas in August last month. Huh? Uh, so it's really good to see uh, some of uh, the old friends again. Um, as previous eminent uh, panelists uh, mentioned very clearly uh, that uh, climate change is a global, critical, and urgent challenge for the world, uh, especially now uh, when the world is facing multiple crises as mentioned by the previous two speakers. Uh, so we know we are facing food and energy crisis, debt crisis, uh, slowing down economic recovery, high inflation, uh, high debt servicing costs, uh, the list can get longer. A climate change induced crisis has severe and multiple ramifications, particularly when we have very bleak global economic outlook right now and also for the coming one or two years. Uh, with uh, rising sea levels and the increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather conditions, uh, like the recent devastating floods in Pakistan, uh, climate change crisis should be addressed with burning, burning urgency. This is especially important for developing countries uh, because the previous speakers also mentioned, because developing and least developed countries in particular have contributed the least to the CO2 emissions, yet they suffer, suffer the most from the climate change effects uh, because of the fragile infrastructure and their less diversified uh, economies. Climate change challenge has to be addressed at international, national, and individual levels. This is because climate change affects countries and people without the constraints of national borders. Uh, it also needs to uh, be highlighted uh, that roughly 50% of many nations' carbon emissions come from private travel and domestic energy use. Therefore, the engagement for climate change mitigation and adaptation should be mobilized from all the three levels. This shows uh, the absolute importance of advocacy of the climate change challenges, uh, as the messages have to reach all these levels. However, as things stand now, it does not seem the ad, uh, advocacy task has been as successful as we wish. Uh, right now, we know the financing gap for climate change mitigation adaptation still remains huge, uh, actually massive. And not all countries have committed themselves uh, to the common endeavor. Therefore, international consensus has not really been reached. In addition, at the individual level, uh, according to survey data, the awareness building is still badly needed. Uh, there is still the perception among the public that the issue of climate change is remote in space and time, uh, which will affect future generations and other countries. So for, for many, climate change is not a kind of personal threat. So not surprisingly, there is re reluctance and also inertia for many people to shift to adopt low carbon lifestyles. Therefore, a strategic approach to communication based on state of the art scientific research should be adopted uh, to link advocacy uh, with a real-time crisis could be a good way to get messages uh, across. Uh, according to scholars, uh, to mobilize engagement would require three key components. Understanding, which is knowledge. Emotion, that includes interest and concern. And the third, behavior. So to take actions. Huh? 
to link real-time crises can make、uh, climate change issues easy to understand.、Uh, this could educate and raise awareness on climate change. As crises cause human suffering, it would evoke emotion like sympathy and concern,、uh, and then this could lead to、uh, changes of behavior and action. Uh, it needs to be highlighted that attitude change could lead to public and government engagement、uh, with climate change mitigation and、uh, adaptation.、Uh, this reminds me of the success in the advocacy for the adoption of the heavily indebted Poor Countries Initiative. Of 1996, I, I myself deal with、uh, development finance issues. Also,、uh, the policy messages at that time managed to attract significant worldwide attention.、Uh, photos of、uh, starving、uh, African babies、uh, showing clearly that African countries had no capacity to service their debt. The message was clear: either service debt and let those children die, or give debt relief to save lives. So it was a good example of linking real-time famine in Africa、uh, with a debt relief campaign. So it was、uh, quite successful. Of course, there are also、uh, other reasons for its success.、Uh, scientists. Have warned us for many years already that, in addition to rising sea levels,、uh, climate change bring about threat of an、uh, increase in the frequency and severity of extreme weather conditions.、Uh, the massive flood in、uh, in Pakistan affected at least、uh, 35 million people, and more than 1,500 people have died. Such kind of crisis draws the attention of the world. This gives an occasion、uh, to highlight that climate change、uh, makes such heavy rainfall more likely. Though it is really difficult to quantify how much climate change had increased the likelihood and frequency of floods in Pakistan. Uh, according to the analysis by a group of、uh, international climate、uh, scientists in Pakistan, Europe,、uh, and、uh, the United States, a、uh, global warming would have increased a、uh, glacier melt throughout the mountain、uh, mountains in Pakistan, and likely contributed to the extreme heat waves prior to the flood. And then the flood、uh, just followed.、Uh, a, a scholar from the University of Michigan of the United States said,、uh, "Let me quote:、uh, Pakistan has not contributed much in terms of causing global climate change, but sure is having to deal with a massive amount of、uh, climate change consequences." This drives home the global nature of the climate change issues, and also shows that no country and no people can be spared from the consequences of climate change.、Uh, extreme weather conditions、uh, are worsening all over the world、uh, under the influence of climate change.、Uh, that makes them greater threats to human、uh, communities. Africa as a whole、uh, contributes、uh, to about two to three percent of global emissions that cause、uh, global warming and climate change, but suffered unproportionately, like Pakistan, from the consequences of climate change. This year, East Africa experienced the driest conditions and hottest temperatures. Uh, since satellite record keeping began, as a result, as many as twenty、uh, five million people are currently experiencing acute food and water shortages. Climate change is intensifying food insecurity across sub-Saharan and other 
regions. Uh, the re resulting rising poverty and other human costs are compounded by cascading macroeconomic effects, including slower economic growth and other uh, impacts as mentioned by uh, previous speakers. So with this crisis countries are currently experiencing, it is a critical time for drawing attention of the government's international community, community and also individuals to the threats of climate change. Uh, advocacy is a complicated task uh, and needs to reach stakeholders at different levels, uh, raise issues of concern, participate in decision making, uh, hold uh, the decision makers accountable for their actions and the work for resolutions. This is most important, uh, the resolutions to their problems through making changes happen. Uh, as climate change is not a local issue, international cooperation on consensus is important. South-South cooperation can help overcome the obstacles uh, that have hindered uh, progress towards international consensus. It would also be important for the Southern countries to exchange experience and lessons in advocacy campaign and also uh, in climate change mitigation and adaptation as a whole. So improvements in technology have facilitated a dramatic increase in accessibility uh, in ICTs around the world. Uh, ICT tools have huge potential uh, for um, advocacy because it's cost effective uh, and it's also, uh, it also has a very wide a reach to the different countries and different peoples. Therefore, it is essential for us to leverage on the use of ICT tools. So on the whole, I would say uh, advocacy is important and we need a strategy and one important and one probably effective uh, avenue uh, would be linking the real-time crisis uh, with uh, the tasks and campaigns of ad advocacy. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Ms. Lee. And Dr. Max Foley is Program Coordinator for Capacity Building and Sustainable Development at the World Academy of Sciences for the last seven years. He is a proficient academician and researchers having 20 years of experience in the area of climate change and sustainable development. Dr. Poli is requested to share his knowledge. Over to you, Dr. Poli. Dr. Max Poli, over to you. Thank you ever so much. And I apologize for the technical glitches, I'm actually in a different room. Welcome, but Welcome I am. Dr. Max, uh, you are perfect and you're audible and uh, perfectly visible. Okay, Please. okay. Please. Okay, let me just uh, find uh, the file. Okay, hope you can uh, hear me and, and see the screen. Yes, we can hear you and your screen is perfect. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, uh, many congratulations to Comsats for the organization of this event on this very critical issue. And I will focus my points on the role of education and science for a change of mindset, which must set the basis for advocacy and diplomacy for climate change. Um, I'd like to start with a cartoon that has 
been seen over the past year or two. And the cartoon uh, um, has a little sentence which says, be sure to wash your hands and all will be well. And the cartoon is basically highlighting that all we uh, were worried about for a certain period of time was a virus. And it wasn't even the first time in human history, obviously, that we had to deal with a virus. But that caused us a temporary uh, blindness. Perhaps uh, I'm, I'm not even being very realistic here by saying temporary, because perhaps the blindness was there even before. But even if now we see that, uh, even if now uh, some people might be able to see over this blindness, they may be worried with the uh, oncoming recession. And so they're worried about their comfort, their pockets, and, and so on. And, and basically, uh, only the scientists really uh, see the big picture. And, and this is an issue. So um, again, I, I will try to demonstrate why education and science are absolutely essential. So I would like to start with a, a, a sharing with you a couple of questions that we've run in a number of workshops over the past um, uh, years. The first question it shows a picture and, and the question is, are you familiar with this limit? The second question is the same. Are you familiar with this limit? But now the picture shows a, a different number with some, um, some um, uh, units. And when we run uh, this question in workshops with these two pictures, we tend to get these, this kind of pattern. We tend to get a, a large number of yeses for the first one. So yes, they are familiar, but sadly we, we seem to get a large number of no, meaning no, I'm not familiar with the second one. Now, the reason why this is extremely sad is because it underlines a common knowledge. So we have common knowledge on a number of areas. Uh, for example, uh, children and, and, and so on, even they know that this symbol in most countries means a speed limit of 50 kilometers per hour. <clears throat> However, so many people do not know uh, that 350 parts per million is the safe level for atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. So we have, we are struggling with common levels of ignorance. I would like to take this a little further because this 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide underlines the safe levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And now actually every, every time I, I, I update this presentation, uh, I have to update this and, 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 and increase this number to, to what it is. But, but the, the point is, this is in, in itself, in itself, this is only part of the whole truth. So again, it underlines the fact that even at the IPCC level or COP26 last year and COP27 forthcoming soon, the, uh, the, the topic of CO2 is also partially uh, common ignorance because it's not taking into account the whole picture. So many people do not discuss or do not um, include in this discussion the role of methane. And we know from science that methane is over 20 times more powerful at trapping heat. We also know from a number of studies that methane emissions, for example, from cattle are much greater than previously uh, known. And we know from various studies that it's been uh, said that uh, avoiding meat and dairy, so we're talking about ruminants here, products from ruminants, is the um, uh, single biggest way to reduce our uh, impact on the planet. Talking about highly uh, uh, reputed uh, scientific uh, research papers, we have this one, for example, uh, published in the year 2020 in Science, and I read with you the title, Global Food System Emissions Could Preclude Achieving the 1.5 and 2 degrees climate change targets. Just before 2020, in 2019, a very interesting nature uh, news feature uh, 
reads as follows, eat less meat, uh, UN climate change report calls for a, a change to human diet. And this is the first time that an IPCC report and IPCC reports are extremely authoritative with a, a great bulk of solid scientific evidence um, called for such a, 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 an action. Now, because uh, the IPCC is an intergovernmental panel, I would also say that this is one of the few times in which we see some kind of communications between science and government. Um, although generally, generally, sadly, uh, that isn't the case. Generally, we do see a gap, a, 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 a disconnect between what scientists uh, say, the language they use and their focus, and what policymakers uh, do say and, 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 uh, and focus on. Now, this, this huge divide is, is uh, actually, uh, in, in, the ter in terms of climate change, is also demonstrated by the following. Um, the following is that we have a, 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 a person uh, such, as, such as this one, uh, Greta from Sweden, who seems to be more uh, catching more attention than, than scientists. And let me talk about someone from the same country uh, so he is Vante Arrhenius is also from Sweden, although, uh, you know, not as, as young as, as Greta. Unfortunately, he's no longer alive, but he uh, um, was awarded the Nobel uh, Prize in 1903. And he's well known for the so-called Arrhenius equation. So if there are any chemists among you, perhaps they will be familiar with this fantastic uh, and amazing um, relationship here. However, Arrhenius also wrote a paper published in 1896 in the philosophical magazine and journal of science. I would like to read with you the title. On the influence of carbonic acid in the air, which is carbon dioxide, upon the temperature of the ground. So if you were to read this paper published in 1896, it basically uh, talks about the greenhouse effect and the uh, likely uh, consequences of the release of a large amount of carbon from uh, the combustion of fossil fuels. Now, in 2016, uh, uh, which is uh, um, o o uh, over 100 years later, over 100 years later, we have uh, this paper in Nature Climate Change, we talks about the climate response to 5 trillion tons of carbon. So if we were really to, to release uh, all the, the carbon that is still in fossil fuels. Now, uh, of course, this paper is very modern, has a huge amount of data, uh, which is much more accurate and precise, but the conclusions are not too different from what over 100 years earlier Svante Arrhenius um, um, uh, conveyed in that paper. So something that I, I find very sad is that uh, scientists are still not uh, attracting as much attention in the media as, as perhaps other personalities. Maybe, maybe this personality uh, of great attractive attraction because of the, of the uh, fact that she's young. And in fact, there is a huge issue that I would like to highlight here, uh, which is an ethical issue, and that is this one. This one uh, is, is a, um, a snapshot from a declaration from a conference of UNESCO which goes back as far as 1997. And the declaration reads as follows, the title, on the responsibilities of the present generations towards future generations. So I was talking about the young person in the previous slide, and, and she represents, say, the, the future generations. In this declaration, we, we have, um, we have, to uh, art, a number of articles, two of which um, specifically make reference to the preservation of life on Earth and the protection of the environment. But the key word, the key word remains this one, which I'm highlighting here, and is responsibility. We must take responsibility. Um, so together with education and science, uh, responsibility has a big role and it highlights a huge 
uh, a huge ethical uh, issue. Another ethical issue of climate injustice is this one here that we, we know very well that uh, a small number of countries are responsible for the largest amount of emissions. And this is another huge area of climate diplomacy and climate injustice that we need to address through education and science. So in uh, many uh, discussions uh, I've been involved in, the typical question that people then, then, then throw back at, at me or at you is this one. What can I do as a single individual? And you know, this, this seems to be the, the question that, that exonerates most people from doing anything actually, or oh, because as a single individual, as a, as a little human being, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing in the big picture and I cannot do anything really. So I will finish off by arguing very strongly against this. So uh, I believe that education has a huge power as demonstrating by this diagram, which I, I refer to as a knowledge action nexus. So through, through science, we can produce knowledge and through education, we can convey knowledge and acquire knowledge. Once we uh, have the knowledge that uh, allows us to understand, okay? Once we understand, we grow a certain consciousness as an awareness that allows us to get to action. And action can lead to change. Now, what should we change? Well, initially, the first thing that we must change as this UNESCO graphic suggests is we should change our minds so that we start uh, to change something other than the climate. And I very much like what um, uh, Bernard Shaw, George Bernard Shaw said a, a number of years ago, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their mind cannot change anything. So then how can we start to change ourselves? through education by educating ourselves. And this is a, a really a, a, a nice way for anyone to start and uh, to prove to you that, you know, you may say, oh, it's just easy to talk. This is just a, a speech. No, I want to prove to you that it's not just a speech because in November, 2021, uh, this was launched together with COP26, in occasion of COP26, Together with a colleague that you see uh, written here, uh, we uh, put together a teaching module. This is a teaching module. This was addressed to high school students, but to be honest with you, it could be used pretty much by anyone. It, it was prepared in English, in the English language, and it was embraced by um, the regional and national government of Italy. And it's also been endorsed by Co Barrett, the vice chair of the IPCC, as well as Professor Bogatai, IPCC Nobel Prize in 2007. So by preparing a teaching module, and I'm not a climate expert, obviously, but I think it's right for a teaching module on climate to be prepared by a non-climate expert so that the right levels and the right um, concepts uh, presented in with the right resources and in the right structure, I think that is, is a, a little step. And I want to demonstrate in this way that uh, we can answer this kind of question. This is just an example. I could come up with many other examples, but I will stop here. And I hope I have convinced you that in terms of climate justice and diplomacy, there is a lot that can be done at any level, even at the level of individuals. So I, I, I thank you so much for the opportunity of and including to us, uh, UNESCO to us in this uh, amazing uh, event that you, you have organized. And, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Pauli. Mr. Abdullah Manabi, Senior Lieutenant Officer at Islamic Organization for Food Security. He served on different positions of international organizations, having experience of 22 years in the field of international 
and multilateral cooperation, diplomacy, training, and education. Mr. Manapi is requested to enlighten us. Over to you, Mr. Manapi. Okay. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you very much to um, Comsat for inviting us, uh, the Islamic Organization for Food Security, to share uh, our humble knowledge on this important topic. Uh, with your permission, I'll be sharing my screen where I'll be making a very uh, short presentation on this uh, in particular issue. Um, <clears throat> Okay, um, I think you all can see my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, your screen is visible. Okay. okay just one minute. Okay. Um, yes, um, my name is uh, the uh, moderator uh, kindly introduced. My name is Abdullah Manaf. I'm originally from Mozambique and I am senior liaison officer at Islamic Organization for Food Security. Um, and I am very happy to be amongst you. And I know that after uh, the wonderful presentation of Mr. Max from uh, UNESCO, it will be very difficult to reach that standard, but I will I'll do my best. Uh, so um, I'm here to share with you the efforts of the IFS in uh, addressing the issue of climate change in the context of uh, food security. But perhaps uh, just uh, for the benefit of all uh, present here, I would be perhaps happy to first share a brief overview of what IFS is. IFS is a, it's, uh, it's, it's an international organization, which is uh, part of the uh, organization Islamic Cooperation, is a specialized agency uh, with the main mission to ensure uh, food security, uh, um, food, with a mission to, to ensure food security, sustainable uh, in OEC member states, uh, through socioeconomic development and, and the systemic promotion of targeted programs related to agriculture, science, technology, humanitarian aid, trade, food exports to uh, IFRS uh, or within OIC uh, member states. Um, our uh, history, a little bit of history, is that uh, so far uh, we have out of uh, 57 member states, uh, 37 are fully fledged member states of IFS. And uh, we're counting that uh, this number will be uh, growing soon as the uh, food security issues have become a kind of priority for majority of uh, member states of OIC. Uh, as far as um, you know, timeline is concerned, we had uh, our first General Assembly in 2016 Second one happened in Saudi Arabia, where we started the, you know, the um, the uh, the strategic program uh, de de development for the organization. Um, in December 2020, we had our third general assembly, where we uh, introduced the notion of 16 programs in the strategic framework of IFS. But uh, in the, uh, the 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 real change come came in the, uh, the fourth general assembly where the strategic vision 2031 was introduced with five pillars, then I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and then we are uh, hoping that the fifth general assembly to take place next year in Tunis um, uh, online, will be able to somehow also uh, direct the organization to new challenges ahead. Uh, so just for your information, this uh, organization is an initiative of the first president of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Mr. Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, when in, during a meeting uh, of the, um, uh, the Economic Forum in June uh, 2011, he alluded to the idea of establishing a food security organization within OSC uh, member states. So as far as, uh, as the 10 year strategy uh, vision that I just mentioned, this is what we have in front of you. I'll not uh, waste much time of this because I'll come back in the next slide, but I just want you to kindly look that uh, in the uh, 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 um, pillar three that has to do with capacity building, 
it's where our issue of uh, um, of climate change or uh, you know our focus is uh, in terms of uh, addressing these the issues um so this uh, 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 vision 2031 is divided in 16 strategic programs um, in the governance enablement we have uh, two programs one is food security governance, and another one is, has to do with food uh, food balance database. On uh, in food security governance, also we deal a lot with the sustainability of food security policies, and the climate change also is there. And we'll, I'll come back to that you know, also in a minute. Um, then the second pillar has to do with food crisis response, uh, where we have uh, food security reserve. Flower for Humanity and Kurban. In fact, um, I was uh, recently in Pakistan where we discussed with the local uh, you know, uh, stakeholders uh, what's going on now in Pakistan due to the issue of floods. We are, of course, in consultations with the concerned authorities of the government to see how IFS can humbly uh, provide its helping hand for this issue uh, after the floods, most probably the issues of uh, food crisis. And, uh, of course, we're uh, when that that is finalized, we'll be very happy to share our our position on the subject. Um, <clears throat> then we have capacity building, and in the capacity building, we have a majority of our programs. Uh, for instance, the development of gene banks, waste strategic commodities that are cassava, wheat, rice, OIC health and safe food environment, uh, safe food uh, ecosystem bio and agri-tech development, um, climate impact resource management, water management and agriculture, transponder pest control. So in program 10 and 11 is where most of our uh, uh, climate change related uh, you know, focus is uh, because it's where we try uh, along with member states to see how can, uh, uh, you know, while producing food, while addressing challenges of food security, we are not, we are at the same time taking care of uh, the cli cli um, our climate. Uh, as far as water, for instance, uh, we are trying, we are doing our best to make sure that the water used in irrigation in agriculture is, uh, is managed sustainably so that, uh, you know, uh, can, can, reach as many people as possible. Just to give you an example, in May uh, this year, we trained um, about uh, almost one, uh, seven, uh, more than 70 farmers in, uh, in uh, Niamey, uh, Niger. They came from, uh, from, a, the count, uh, from some provinces of Niger and they came to Niamey. We trained them in their local language on how to, uh, uh, how to manage uh, you know, uh, the water uh, in, a, in, in a sustainable manner. Then we also have industry development uh, that deals with uh, food system talent development and also where the one of our subsidiary uh, International Food Islamic Processing Association is part of it. And the last last pillar has to do with resource mobilization where we have green fund um, and also uh, we are uh, this green fund is yet to be to be finalized. And uh, once finalized, it will be uh, helping you know farmers uh, to somehow deal with uh, cash flows to support their own projects. We have, of course, national food sector development in cooperation with state agencies in uh, OIC member states. So, um, as I said, um, it's very important to look at the program uh, for food security governance. Uh, but if you look a little bit at the map here, you see that these are our, our in yellow, these are member states of IFS. In green, the member states of OIC that are yet to join um, um, uh, IFS, and we hope, as I said, that ha will happen uh, soon. So uh, the food security uh, governance program, uh, an overview is uh, supported in, uh, unanimously by all member states. and. Um, it uh, it's uh, it, it's one of the pillar and uh, it's a, a kind of effective and efficient government food security system plan uh, policy making and governance. So somehow we are helping member states on how to make sure that whenever they design their food security or agriculture development policies, they are in line with the, all the sustain, sustainable development goals or the discourse and narratives on climate uh, uh, you know, protection uh, and change and everything that is happening in that specific front. Um, and as you can see, some of the objectives of that, of this policy, uh, of this program, 
is related with building platforms and establish network for exchange and accumulation of OSC's experience in post security governance to facilitate share of best practice, uh, 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 as well as to assist member states, and I said, in developing coherent police framework. Um, of course, uh, within this uh, uh, work that we are doing, we develop a kind of structure that shows how what is the approach of the IFS when it comes to food security governance uh, to reach a uh, you know, sustainable food system, that costs markets, et cetera. Of course, uh, for, the, for the benefit of time, we'll not go you know, one by one, but this is more or less the structure that we're trying to implement with our, our member states. And you can see down here, uh, our, our, our goal is to find the resilience in mitigation to make sure that we are, we are addressing economic crisis, climate change uh, and conflicts and diseases and epidemics while uh, developing this uh, sustainable food system in, uh, you know, OIC geography. So, um, uh, as I say, when, when we look at this uh, food security uh, uh, governance, you will understand that the, uh, the components uh, have to do with sharing best practice, improving national legislation, developing police framework, and building government mechanisms in three OIC regions, uh, because OIC within the 57 countries is divided in three regions, Asia, uh, Middle East and North Africa, and Sub-Saharan -Sub -Sub Africa. For you to have an idea, in 2022, we have implemented a series of regional training workshops on strategic planning and policy development, including in Abu Dhabi uh, last May, now this today, yesterday and today, we're having one in, in, in Cairo, and we are expecting to do the next one, inshallah, in uh, November in, uh, in, in Abuja. So here it's where we discuss with member states the concept of IFS food security, as well as we analyze uh, the food security policies uh, along with, uh, with what can be done to make sure that their policy are, uh, are climate change, are climate change friendly. So for 2023, we are thinking, of course, to make sure that we continue with this work through workshops, conferences, uh, to monitor and evaluate how this issue of food security situation is being, uh, is being addressed by member states without, of course, forgetting that those, uh, those addressing of the challenge should be climate uh, you know, friendly. And um, uh, we will, of course, introduce the idea of using data for food security decision-making mechanism, and also uh, uh, look at waste uh, management and food banking, uh, because uh, you know it's very important as well. And we are uh, trying to uh, launch uh, our first food security index, and we publish uh, analysis of these same uh, uh, policies. So when it comes to uh, uh, climate change, um, as we, as we all know, uh, climate change is more the climate's the most important environmental factor influencing agricultural production. Um, so uh, agriculture here will play an important role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions through the sequestration and storage of carbon in soils and in crops, including trees. So here for us, we, uh, we deal with all these issues uh, through three different clear goals to make sure that uh, uh, whenever there is, uh, there is, uh, uh, we, we address the issue of food security, we should be doing in, in, in a sustainable agriculture through uh, where there is a health climate to make sure that no one is, is harming our, our, our climate uh, or environment. So the first is that we uh, the, the first objective is to combat desertification and mitigate the effects of drought. Uh, what do we do? We uh, we we try to develop uh, uh, irrigation environmental friendly technology, as well as introducing and we are working with member states, particularly Niger, sky management and clouds to cope with drought. Um, also, uh, we. Uh, very much focus on agriculture and natural resources, where we somehow look at the uh, issues related with uh, preservation of agriculture ecosystem and valorization of uh, natural resources that are, uh, are available. The third objective is to make sure that we reduce greenhouse emissions by 
making sure that uh, agriculture, uh, uh, you know, does not uh, uh, is is not done uh, uh, using practices that, that can uh, can 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 uh, uh, is done why, uh, with with a practice that reduce carbon dioxide, methane, and uh, nitrous oxide in the soil. Of course, we are also thinking of um, organic farming, smart agriculture while making sure the livestock and the feed additives are taken care of uh, in, the, in the right manner. So um, the implementation of IFS climate vision uh, uh, is a governance that requires bilateral cooperation on five different levels that I'll just mention now. Uh, the first one, uh, it, it has to do with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the first one, it has to do with uh, pl uh, public, public sector. Because uh, you know the public sector is where uh, we have uh, um, uh, government, public authorities, and these are the actors that are responsible for, for developing public policy and decision making at the national level of each country. So uh, we should, of course, have the uh, the political support from member states to implement whatever policy that we have in the domain of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, climate uh, climate. Uh, 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 vision that the IFS has. The second sector it, is the private sector, and you, we, you all know here better than I do that the uh, um, private sector is among the biggest generator of, it, of greenhouse uh, emissions. So we think that the action that needs to be prioritized here is to change uh, production patterns, adjusting energy matrices, and developing more sustainable produ production cycle or distribution and marketing systems. So, giving this responsibility, we believe that uh, 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 it's very important to create technology that mitigate and adapt to, to all these uh, visions that we have in terms of, of, of climate. Uh, the third uh, third sector is um, is academic one, uh, where of course we have to make sure that there is enough research, it's enough knowledge available to uh, to to somehow. Uh, be the foundation of this uh, IFS climate vision that we have, and of, obviously we would look at the fourth uh, fourth uh, sector is local government, um, because it's very important for them to make sure that uh, whatever uh, action that uh, we we have we suggest is viable from local perspective and has to do with their social uh, related environment. And uh, lastly, it has to do with civil society uh, because it contributes to the decision making process through feedback, opinion, and suggestions. And we are very soon try work. We'll start working with them through having a specific forum for the civil society to discuss several issues with particular focus to this issue of climate uh, of IFS climate vision. So, uh, dear uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, this is what uh, I had to share with you today and I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for Comsats for having invited us to be in this important event. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Munapi. Uh, professor Dr. Lee Cho is Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science, Climate and Environment. He's serving as Director of International Center for Climate and Environmental Science. The Chinese Academy of Sciences since 2003. He has experience of 28 years in the area of climate change, environment, and meteorology. Professor Lin, please enlighten us with your knowledge. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Yes. So, okay. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, I'm very honored that we have the opportunity yeah, to give a talk yeah, in this webinar. So next, I would like to share my presentation. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, we can see. Okay. So uh, actually, today, yeah, my talk is try to uh, address the effective role of international organizations in climate diplomacy. So I'm Zhao Hui Lin. Yeah, I'm yeah, from the International Center for Climate and Environment Sciences. And this is uh, we are Center of Excellence of Comsas. And also our center is in the CAS Park Center of Excellence. Yeah, also working on climate and environment sciences. Yeah, from Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, today we learned that yeah, actually for climate change, we have 
uh, have a climate crisis has been a potential. We have a cost very significant. Also, so high <laughs> Okay, so we have, you know, we, we have the other increase in temperature. We can have a cost of water resources issues and also co can cause the sea level rising and also can have certain lives and live the foods around the world. So, and during the last past uh, 20 years, yeah, based on IPCC, yeah, there are six. We have uh, two billion people have experienced a major devastating uh, flooding events, and even one point billion yet uh, uh, suffer from drought, and even more far from the sea, uh, 700 billion is, uh, is suffering from a damaging uh, tropical storms. So this is always caused by the climate change yeah, related uh, diseases. And actually, we have very, very strong evidence and then all these uh, human-induced climate changes have led to increased risk of the drop. And especially, I think, more than yeah, around 90% occurred in developing countries. So especially, you know, we now this year, we have a flooding, a devastating flooding in Pakistan. So a total of yeah, 33 million people are affected by this, yeah, by this drought, yeah, and then the flooding issues. So the UN Secretary and the Chief yeah, visit Pakistan. He also appealed for a massive international support yeah, and to bolster the response and tackle with this crime the catastrophe. So actually we can say this is one of the, yeah, the, the, the products of the, this climate change. Right? The, 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 I think the severe and the climate change issues. So this is actually all, uh, all yeah, related to the climate change issues. Okay. Okay. So, but how about you know, the, the, the climate yeah, diplomacy? So we know we have international IPCC, right? The international governmental panel. We have a, on climate change. We are working together. Yeah, we have more than yeah, I think around 195 member countries to join in this year and the, the panels. They try to issue the different scientific support, right, for the climate change yeah, report. So currently, yeah, until now, we already yeah, issued uh, six. Uh, we have uh, just, just last year have issued a six uh, 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 IPCC, yeah, and, uh, and the climate change report. And this yeah, report can provide yeah, more uh, very valuable information yeah, for the governments, yeah, for the city governments, yeah, for the policy makers, and also even for the uh, climate yeah, regula regulations. So this is one of the uh, efforts, yeah based on the different uh, international government, not only to the South South, but also uh, I think mostly uh, law South and North law, all the countries. But however, actually, you know, just mentioned that in, in developing countries, you know, we do actually have a kind of a lot of uh, problems. We, we are many uh, severely, uh, severely uh, affected by the climate change. So especially the South South cooperation and even triangular cooperation are very critical for the developing countries in order to mitigate and to adapt to the climate changes. So this is just, yeah, just, yeah, set, yeah, by the, yeah, you want, yeah, achieve. So among the different yeah, science and diplomacy, I think the crime diplomacy is one of it because of the crime crisis, right? So it's one of the most important, the urgent, yeah, diplomacy we need to work together. Uh, so this during this, which is quite important, yeah, for a climate negotiation and a science diplomacy, is try to push, yeah, to provide more information, yeah, to the climate decision, yeah, making. All this is very, very important for this. Uh, but now we, we can, like, okay, in China, just for example, in China, we also, based on, yeah, this, yeah, different, yeah, report, like, we China also try to contribute more, yeah, to the climate change issues. We have released the, the plans for the climate change mitigation. So we are trying to scale up, yeah, intended the listener, yeah, determine the contributions by adopting more, yeah, policies and measures. And we are going to have the, that, the CO2 emission peak before the 2030. And, and also we can try to achieve, yeah, our goal is to achieve the carbon neutrality before the 2050. So this is the yeah, Chinese government's education. And also uh, from Chinese academic sciences, we are working on, uh, yeah, uh, on the yeah, additional yeah, scientific research and also the technologies. So in, in, even in CAS, we also take actions to support the additional carbon goal. For example, we just uh, released yeah, yeah, this March, release a strategic uh, action plan to support the additional governments yeah, and, and, and the, the goals. 
So we have different, for example, we have the before the 2025, 20, we will make some breakthroughs in the numbers of key technologies, which can support in the, the carbon peak year goals, and also can try to promote in the low carbon and green transformation of the economy and the society. So these are different yeah, measures. I think this is quite important. Yeah, you know, we are in, in the national in the, in the levels. One more, actually, we also in Chinese government, we also have yeah, issue yeah, one of the launch, one of the big, yeah, big science facility to support the, the climate change study. I think in, in here we have uh, the, in the Chinese government, we have yeah, provide one point around 1.3 billion Chinese, yeah, it, it, Chinese currency, the, the RMB, to, to develop Earth system science numerical simulation facility, it costs Earth fat. And this Earth lab is not only the software models and also the supercomputing resources in order to fully understand the interactions between, uh, the, the, between the different uh, yeah, interactions between different components of the Earth system. You will, in order to, I think, to, to more to reduce uncertainties for the future crime projection. So this is one of the, yeah, uh, the facilities the Chinese government also to do. So we can provide, based on this yeah, vicinity, we can just provide more information or for the prediction, yeah, for the disasters, and it also can provide more yeah, reliable climate change projection results. And even we can, based on this facility, we can also can provide a number, numerous yeah, data, the modern modeling data, projection data. Yet we can provide this in group globally, and also we can, especially we can also can for this data can be used there yeah, for different countries to share the information. So, but how do you yeah, what we have, and then what yeah, the law of international organization can do in the climate diplomacy. So I think you can give some examples, you know. I think, if, for example, in the, the most is, we can say the international organization is very important, right? Because there are just many yeah, multilateral platforms for scientific diplomacy. So, we, and also they can, they can create the effective partnership between the science scientists, policy makers, and the diplomats and different, so, and can try to solve the major challenges. Yeah, all this relate to the developing countries. Yeah. So this is what, uh, generally speaking, yeah, for international organization is very important. Because they can link so many yeah, organizations, so many yeah, different yeah, research institutions and universities together, and also different stakeholders. Uh, I give several examples, and quite how important is it? Uh, actually, in our center, we call ICCES. We have center of just mentioned before, right? We can center of center of excellence of Comsas and also the CAS Plus. We have long history with work, working on these two major international organizations. And we have found that this year we can have give them very really good yeah, opportunities, a lot of resources, and try to develop more yeah, multilateral cooperation in the past decade. So one of the examples is for Thomas, you know, we have this is the, 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 the governmental and also organization, right? So we have the Comsat this family. So we developed a Comsat International Symmetrical Research Group. They are focusing on climate and environmental protection. This is one of the examples. We have different countries work together. Another, I think, great example is just uh, the, the host, yeah, the Comsa Center for Climate and the Sustainability. So this is just established uh, several years ago. Uh, actually, ICCS, we have established in one, uh, we just established in 1991. So uh, as the first uh, center of excellence, yeah, working on climate environment sciences. So using this network, we already yeah, just try to push yeah, to develop, uh, to, to afford a establishment of the Comsas Center of Excellence, yeah, Center for Climate and, and CCCS. Another effort uh, I would like to mention is that we have the CAS Plus WMO Forum. And this is another forum we have because uh, CAS Plus and also at WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. So we established a forum focused on climate science. And this is a several, I think, it, as examples of how this international organization can work together and can uh, provide a very good yeah, platform for the corporations that we're dealing with in the climate change issue. So for, again, this is some detail, I think some very detailed in, in information that actually this is the Comsat International Symmetrical Research Group. We have, this, this group is established in uh, 20, uh, 2010. 
So we have uh, yeah, in the, the meeting, we have uh, actually, we have the, the, the foundation meeting in, in foundation meeting in Beijing, uh, the, uh, Mr. Fahai also attend this meeting. So we just, you know, if we try to deal with the climate, there are changes issues. So the most important, I think the first thing is that we need to do what happened. And what's the reasons, mechanisms, how much, you know, the list extremes can be ascribed to the climate change. And how much is maybe is a, can be ascribed to the nature of variability. So actually, based on this, yeah, systematic research group, we are because we are scientists, we are working on the science. So we need to understand. So the first thing we are in this systematic research group, we can try to collect the data set from different countries, and we work together to understand the characteristics and mechanism of all these extreme climate events. And we also can do the comparison to choose the different mechanisms for different countries. So this is one of the examples we have done. So another one just mentioned, we have Comsa Center of Climate and Sustainability. You know, climate change is not only just for basic, for the science, for climate science, but also they have a huge impact in different sectors. So also this impact is very crucial for the sustainable development. And currently this is, uh, I think year 2000, uh, two, 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 uh, I think 2000, so we have, currently we have CCCS and we have, Currently, we have uh, this is just led, led working of the whole Comsa. But actually, currently we have fifteen uh, Comsa member countries have joined the Comsa centers of climate and uh, sustainability the led working and try to work together to engage in establishing the CCCS right in their respective countries. I think today we today we have this webinar. So I think this is one of the example we can to get together the different uh, people from different countries and also in the other international organizations to work together to dis have more discussion and to further, I think, mean, to deepen the, 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 the interaction and cooperations between the different the, uh, the countries or different uh, research institutions, organizations. And third example I'd like to show here is the CAS Plus Memo Forum on Crime Science. And this uh, is very, very, uh, very important. Yeah, this, this, this uh, forum is established in year 2000. And at that time, the, the president of CAS, yeah, Lu Yuanxiang, and that time also the, the past president, the past executive director, uh, to, to, uh, the elected director, uh, and also the WMO, the secretariat general of WMO, Basi, uh, and also they just work together and to establish this forum. And we sort of focus on crime science. This is because actually also we understand, uh, we, we also realize the importance of the climate changes and also the lead, how this can impact on, the, on, on different disasters. So from that time, uh, actually for, since the year 2000, uh, we have already organized the 18 times of the CDWF forums. And also we have different peoples, I think more than 1000 people join and also most people is from, also from, they, they are from, uh, actually from developing countries and also even from countries from the uh, more than uh, 30 uh, countries. So this is an international organization, this inter international platform to share the experience. So this is show, actually this is the map at the very beginning. This is from WCIP, uh, from this is the Professor Chen here. And also the, they are, these are all the class members, these are BASI. Okay, so and this is the president uh, uh, by training. Actually, it's, it's in, this is a very, very good, yeah, yeah, a, a, a very good example to show different people work together. And, and then Hassan, yeah, Hassan is the executive director of class at the time. So all the people work together and join. This is also, this is Morenzi also attend this meeting. You see, okay, for this very crucial, if he step in this kind of forum, it's very crucial for the least developed countries in order to have to increase the, the, the climate awareness and also try to make the very yeah, reliable predictions of crime disasters. So in order to reduce for this, for, for, for I think the loss, yeah, mitigation or, or reductions. So, so this is, uh, I think, yeah, what we have here through some examples. So actually, and, and I think actually all these uh, efforts, we, we also, ICCS, we also have deeply evolved in all these activities. Uh, I think yes, I just very really, uh, few yeah, as a words yeah try to 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 to, to have more yeah brief introduction of ICCS. Uh, our uh, center is founded 
Yeah, we focused yeah, in 1991, we focused on climate environment sciences. So training is really, I think, in 1991, a long, long time ago, right? And after that, at the very beginning, we have become the first yeah, common science center of excellence. And at that time, we are the first yeah, the, the center, the center of excellence working on climate and environmental sciences in that time. And, and after that, in the year 2000, we have become a secretariat of the CAST Parliament Forum. So this is organized by both by the three organizations, international organizations. In the year 2013, we became one of the first Castro Center of Excellence. We still focus on climate environment issues, we challenge it. So this is also just show that in, in the TWAS website, right? We try to build ambitious yeah, centers of excellence there, and all of a sudden they just focus on climate environment issues. So this is what we we have learned, and then based on this, yeah, these centers, we got support, yeah, very very strong support from both the CAS and also TWAS. And so we, we try to establish the international yeah, networkings, the science, technology, and the innovation network. We can have based on yeah, based on all these yeah, networking, we can through different ways, right, to sign MOU, to do the cooperation, and and more than yeah, more than twenty countries we work together. And also more than 10 yeah, institutions, we have different yeah, MOU signed. And for example, we can also work on the China Sri Lanka Joint Center for Education and Research. And China Pakistan, we have Earth Science Research Center. We have also worked with them and try to, for example, this year we have very yeah, severe flooding, right? Occurred in Pakistan. So based on our model system, we can make a prediction. And also we can try to figure out what's the mechanism, the causes for these regimes. And also we submit all this information also to the high, yeah, Ministry of Higher Education yeah, of Pakistan. And even we can also can work with the Pakistan for the IUB. So we on the consortium on climate change, sustainability and the conservation. So this is another organization. We have more than around 66 yeah, research institutions and also the universities work together and try to work together. So I think this is one of the activities we do. And another one, I think quite important, just mention that we, what do we, we are also focused on education and training for the South. You know, for the climate science, also, actually, for example, in Africa or in some developing countries, we do a lot, we do lack of yeah, all these, yeah, the people that are really working on the climate sciences. Right? So, actually, I think in order to for, for the enhanced the capacity of building is very important in all for us yeah, to understand it and also to further to make the, 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 the decisions or policies makers yeah, to, to, to try to mitigate or reduce the impact of from climate change. So this is kind of example, yeah, and then the doctor, yeah, Lashore, he's from former director of PMD, the Pakistan Meteorological Department. Actually, he's a graduate or from, he's a graduate, got a degree yeah, and then a doctor degree from our, our center. So, and also in every year we have just organized international training workshops. This is what we have. Yeah. And, but during actually we previously we have just on site and yeah, the training workshop. Yeah. We also joined with the commons. But during the COVID 19, so sometimes we can only can reduce and also can have on, the, the, the online side. Yeah, I hope yeah, next year we can have more. Yeah. The, 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 the capacity buildings or training workshops. Yeah. On side, yeah. So people, I think it's very important for them to get together, to sit together, and have more discussion. It's quite important than on site meetings. And also, we have in not only uh, for, for this kind of, also have participate in different multilateral organizations. For example, we have the meeting, right? The Comsas, yeah, the member countries work together. Also, we have the participate in the IPCC. For example, we have yeah, already published our model. The projection system, the, the, the prediction result, the projection IPCC, um, AR6, the result is based on, we, we have also provided our model, yes, historical simulation or projection results to the IPCC. So, and also to other yeah, countries, for example, Thailand and also Pakistan. And also we have attended different international organizations, like International Commission on Polar Meteorology, the different organizations. So this is a, give one example, right? This is what we can see from here. This is the CAS Earth Simulator. This is what can be used for climate change studies over the European countries. This is what we have. This is what we can. This simulator 
we can have the atmospheric ocean and different components of Earth system. And then we can make the simulation and also the projection of the future changes of not only the atmosphere, the rainfall temperature, but also we have the CS and also have marine activity and even the, and the aromatic aerosols. And this is a very, very important tool that we can, for example, I'll give some example. This we can use this one for, for crime study in developing countries. This we can apply for the, yeah, the, the Indochina Peninsula, right? For the seasonal heat wave predictions, so very, very high skills. And also this is for West Africa and in the, in the West Africa. So we can have the observation for rainfall and also for not just the survey of the yeah, simulation or projection. So I think this is all these issues that actually we can we can base on different platforms and we can make for take a good great opportunity to be provided by the international organizations and then we can further to develop the, the international networking and also to promote more bilateral inter collaborations on the climate science. So I think what I had I think in the future what we can do in the further so for the more multilateral cooperation on climate change I think we can further try to work more yeah, for the south 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 cooperation to promote more yeah close cooperation and then we, we I think sometimes we can need to develop we can just mention we can provide our models modeling system facilities right and then also can provide because in developing countries they may not have their own model right and they I think about the ABCC, there are six models, more than, yeah, more than uh, 50 models, but only have three, uh, three models yeah, from, from, from developing countries, one from China, and another one from India, and, and also another one yeah, from Brazil. But this is only four or three models from developing countries. But most and all the others are from developed countries. And also we can even can promote basing, uh, promote for the prediction yeah, capacities. And also try to promote the more joint research, yeah, between among the different countries and, and, and different yeah research institutions. So I think we can hope. I think we can. We need we need a more cooperation. I think and based on, I think, but we still need uh, the, the different in, international organizations to work together, and then we can I think we can further can mitigate and we'll try to I think to to adapt to the you know, climate change yeah and related yeah, impacts. Okay, so thank you very much, yeah, for your for your kind of attention. So let's on. Thank you, Professor Lin. Uh, we highly appreciate and acknowledge the support of ICCS towards concepts, initiatives, and programs, especially uh, the network of CS. So now I would like to invite Mr. Yuso. Mr. Mr. Yusuf is climate change specialist at Islamic Development Bank. His areas of expertise are climate finance, clean energy, water, and agriculture. Mr. Yusuf is requested to take the platform. Mr. Yusuf, um, um, can you can you can you hear me? Can you come? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Hello. Uh, are you there, Mr. Yusuf? Uh, we can see your presentation, but we are unable to hear you.
Mr. Yusuf, can you check with audio? I'm unmute. Mr. Yusuf, can you please unmute? Um, so I can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Sincere apologies. Um, I, I think I was having some um, minor technical um, itches. Apologies. Um, um, first and foremost, I think I would like to say a very big thank you. But can you confirm you can see my screen, you can see my video? Because I can't actually see the entire thing on my workspace here. So I just, I need your confirmation to be able to tell me that everything is clear, my voice and- Yes, Mr. Yusuf, we can, we can see you as well as we can hear you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. First, um, I think I would um, like to extend um, our sincere, sincere thanks to, to our colleagues from um, Comsat for inviting us to, to be part of um, today's webinar. Um, today, um, I'll be giving um, my very short presentation on the catalytic role of climate finance um, for effective climate diplomacy. Uh, so I'll be giving the perspective of a multilateral development bank, um, which is gonna be what you would typically get if you were to have a similar presentation from um, whether it's Asian Development Bank, um, the World Bank, um, um, in the case of African Development Bank or Inter American Development or any of the other multilateral development bank um, um, across the, um, um, the globe. So today, I would just go quickly. Um, I, I would just go quickly to talk about the the, the bank in terms of. Uh, Sorry, I actually don't know why my, I can't see my slide moving, unfortunately. I don't know why. Okay, so today I'm just gonna talk about the bank and I'm gonna talk about the global footprint of the bank. So the Islamic Development Bank is a multilateral development bank. I hope you can, um, okay, good. Uh, the Islamic Development Bank is a multilateral development bank based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Um, we actually, uh, have a membership of about 57 countries, and then we're working about 100 countries, which 57 countries, including non-member countries, um, that's uh, Muslim communities um, across the globe, um, from North America down to Far Asia and, and South America, as well as across, um, across Europe. Um, as a bank, in terms of our regional presence, we do have 11 regional hubs um, that cut across the four continents um, where we actually work. And um, the work that we do, they actually range from issues around eradicating poverty, issues um, of increasing employment, um, improving social well-being and lives of our, of, our, of our member state and our client and communities across the globe. Now, to go to the issues around the overview of climate action at the bank. So when we talk about the issues around climate diplomacy at the ISDV, I think whoops, there are some fundamentals that actually guide um, the way in which we work. For instance, we part of what we do as a bank is to encourage the collective action among our member states and stakeholders that we actually um, um, work with, which is basically um, looking at issues around climate action from the perspective of multilateralism, considering that we are a multilateral development bank. And the other very crucial point is the fact that our processes and every action that we take when it comes to climate change issues are country-led, uh, meaning that um, we, do not drive, we do not drive this process. We allow our clients to drive this process, but we play that facilitating role to ensure that um, uh, all aspects of their plans, of their commitments, um, they, they reflect very well in the activities and the financing and the support that we actually provide to our client. Uh, but also when, when we talk about climate finance um, for, for our client, one of the key things that, that, that's the bedrock is the fact that we look at it through the lens of co-benefit, co-benefit in the sense that we are a multilateral development bank. Our core mandate is development financing, all right? So, but then climate finance comes within the context of development finance that we provide to our clients. So whether we're providing clean energy infrastructure, whether we're providing, um, 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 what's it called, energy efficiency infrastructure, whether we're providing ad adaptation um, 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 sort of investment to give resilience and things like that, they all call within the scope of the development finance that we actually provide. And as I said earlier, that the bank is actually the world largest South-South multilateral development bank. So meaning that the bank is driven largely by Southern institution, for southern uh, for by, by southern countries for southern countries so the whole idea is that it's owned by countries in the global south for countries in the global south which makes it very unique um, among all the other mdvs um, which has a combination of both global north and south membership 
Um, uh, and uh, when, when we talk about issues around climate diplomacy, uh, specifically within the context of our country, one thing that is very um, evident uh, among our clients is the fact that climate issues is actually intertwined with economic development, so which is largely driven when we talk about what is driving green economic growth in our client countries is largely driven by those economic development goals, right? The national plans of our country, the global national vision and 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 and, and goals of, of of course within the context of the SDGs and things like that. So one of the key things that we also prioritize as a bank, uh, which is very evident from our policy to our action plan, is the role that partnership actually plays. So we, as much as possible, leverage partnership from the global north, from the global south, um, to be able to actually advance um, climate action within the bank, whether for financial resource mobilization um, or for other high-level um, dip diplomatic um, 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 discussion. And this is very evident when you look at the strategy of the bank. This is the new and the realigned strategy of the bank. You would notice that like two of the main pillars of the bank are specifically looking at how to actually drive and support climate action. The first being driving green, resilient, and sustainable infrastructure through our investment. Um, so, which is basically saying that the bulk of our investment will be, will be going through things like clean and renewable energy, sustainable multimodal transport, agriculture, and rural development that are in the form of smart climate, smart agriculture, digitalization, and the role that they play in helping to tackle poverty and beauty, resilience, and ultimately helping countries to actually drive um, green economic growth. So, and you can see Islamic finance, climate change, being some of those very cross-cutting issues alongside other thematic areas like women, youth, and capacity. But in the end, one of the fundamental things is that you can see climate finance being at the core um, of the strategy of the bank um, that was approved by, 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 by the management of the bank late last year. Um, and you can also see that from the framework that all MDBs, this is the framework that all of us as MDBs, the 10 multilateral development banks, largest multilateral development bank in the world, came together. And in fact, we've been working on this in the last four years since Katowice um, 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 to, to see how we can actually develop a framework that allows us because of the, 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 the likeness of the type of operations and activities that we do to support our clients because our member states are more or less the same, the same countries. So this framework is specifically helping to say, how do we align all of our activities, all of our investment um, uh, to the goals of the Paris Agreement that allows for mobilizing climate finance and things like that. You can see that there are six building blocks, but one of them that I'm gonna talk about specifically today is on climate finance, which is BB3, which is how we actually tend to accelerate the contribution to transition through climate finance. How do we mobilize partnership? How do we mobilize collaboration between multilateral development banks to be able to support our client to increase climate finance that can actually help them in transition and to support other activities such as whether it's adaptation, whether it's mitigation, and whether it's even actually developing long-term strategies and things like that. So MDBs, we came up together with this framework, which as um, um, uh, for all of us, we intend that by the end of next year, 2023, we hope be fully Paris aligned in terms of all of our activities and, 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 and portfolio, uh, portfolios of the bank. So in terms of um, how we as a bank, we actually use the climate finance to accelerate contribution to climate diplomacy. Uh, we would all agree that finance actually plays a very critical and crucial role in the whole climate change debate. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why the debate has been so delayed today is because of who bears the responsibilities of climate action that is to be taken, whether by developing countries and uh, the expectation that the bulk of the financing will typically come from the developed um, countries. So financing plays a very crucial role. But one thing that we do know is that today we do have a huge climate finance gap. Uh, and we do, uh, we, from the, the, the analysis that we have done as an MDB and across uh, uh, MDBs, is to see that the gap, the, the gaps that we currently have today, they run from billions to trillion. And it's about time that we, as financial institutions and all other partners, including private sector players, continue to play that role. And one of the things that the bank has actually done is to actually set up an action plan, action plan for 2022 to 2025, to see how we can actually help our clients to be able to mobilize more climate finance resources, which are targeted specifically to those climate-oriented um, type of investment, including mitigation and climate resilient um, resilient investment. And as a result of that, the board decided to actually have a target that by 2025, 35% of all of our investment will be geared towards climate action. And we do anticipate that by the time we meet this target, we are on track to meet this target because as last year, we're we are almost at, at 35, um, as of 2021, we're almost at 35%. And we anticipate that by 2025, we will take much more ambitious step to go beyond that to be able to, to increase the proportion of climate finance that actually gets to our clients. So and you will find this across all MDBs. 
In fact, all MDBs, we have actually made this 2025 target and we are currently reviewing this even to see how we can be much more ambitious as we get into the 2030s. And now as MDBs collectively, one of the ways in which we have also committed is that when you look at the left chart, you will see that in 2021, the total climate finance that we have actually is actually huge. It's in the tune of $66 billion. And about 41%, 41 billion out of that 66 actually went to low and middle income countries. So a part of our commitment um, um, in 2019 at the UN Secretary General Summit in New York was the fact that we said that by 2025, we want to actually increase the proportion of that financing to 65%. We have been able to actually surpass this. Even as of last year, we were able to go beyond 18 billion uh, collectively as MDBs in terms of total adaptation finance that we've actually provided. Uh, but then we're also talking about how do we develop those sort of tools that can actually help our clients, particularly in the global south, in the middle and no, low and middle income countries to develop these upstream and policy um, ad ad advisory services that it can use to actually mobilize more climate finance resources, technical assistance, which are some of the tools that we, uh, that we, uh, we actually provide as MDBs, including ourselves, uh, um, to our client, including some of the financial instruments, which I may not be able to talk about today because of the debt that's actually involved, as well as um, syndication platforms. Um, but one thing that is also fundamental is that we understand that MDBs alone cannot solve the huge financial need that is needed for climate action particularly in the global south. And this is one of the reasons why we're capitalizing and leveraging the potential that comes from the private sector, which is uh, from the opportunities that come with, uh, as well as other market-based instruments that are able to actually help us um, uh, as a bank. In fact, uh, about, about, about two years ago, the bank actually raised one of the largest grains to cook ever raised globally um, and, uh, um, to be able to actually support our client um, particularly in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in part of Asia, to be able to actually advance climate action um, uh, in their respective jurisdiction. And of course, one fundamental thing is that in all of this that we do, we continue to take action, to continue to take into account the perspective of just transition to be ensure that what we're talking about transition in these countries is as just and is as fair as possible. Now, this is my last slide, uh, my second to last slide, by, by the way. But one other thing that I think is very important to talk about, I talked about the fact that the bank is the largest South-South uh, multilateral development bank. One of the very flagship programs that the bank has been so successful in using in the past year, particularly in advancing climate action, is what we call the reverse linkage program. It's a tripartite type of um, a, a facility that our clients, they actually use in actually addressing climate action um, of all sorts, whether it's around technology, whether it's around um, climate solutions, whether it's around in agriculture sector, in energy sector. And we've seen it very successfully applied in the context of say a country like morocco that has technology when it comes to issues around clean energy renewable energy and then passing that on to countries like niger and other and other countries in sub-saharan africa um, we play that role as facilitators um, with some certain seed funds to be able to support our clients to be able to do that the south south um, um, and, and triangular corporation has been so successful in the fact that it's, it's able to actually get a whole lot of skills and capacity that you would typically not have imagined existed in the global south uh, to be shared among global south players and and we've been able to see that being applied particularly in the area of climate action and we continue to expect that we would we would, we would, we would, we would do that but another aspect that we've been able to do so well particularly in the area of climate finance is to see how we mobilize climate finance from specialized funds and facilities for our client um, specialized funds that are particularly when you look at the case of the GCF, which is the largest uh, multilateral um, specialized climate fund in the world, where we've been able to actually mobilize climate finance resources specifically for um, uh, um, our clients. So these are different sources from our own normal, ordinary capital resources, um, resources coming from the capital market, or other resources coming from um, our shareholdership. But it's also the resources that actually comes from um, uh, uh, dialogue, uh, diplomatic engagement between countries that, that we were able to actually play a facilitating role to ensure that to, to bring them together clearly to actually advance, advance climate action. Considering that we know that finance remains the biggest obstacle that many countries do face. The ideas are there. The solutions are known from the presentations that colleagues have made. We know what the solutions are. We know what the actions needed that are needed to, to be done. We know what they are. But the question is that where will the financing come? Who will finance them? Who will be at the cost? That's usually the big elephant in the room. And that's one of the roles that we play as a financial, as a financial institution. Uh, and we, we hope that we'll continue to do this continuously from time to time, either in the area of capacity building or in the area of specifically, like we can see here from large scale projects that you see from high speed train projects from 
uh, uh, middle income countries to 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 um, to, um, to, to, to upper upper middle income countries, even to low income countries, to to things like small agriculture projects. So it's a combination and a mix of all of them. We have them in different skills, in different characteristics that we've been able to apply um, for different contexts of our clients. But in a nutshell, I think one thing that is very crucial to talk about is the fact that financing continues to play a very key role in climate diplomacy. And MDBs, they play a very crucial role in helping to actually advance this, using, using various um, instruments from market-based, um, 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 ordinary, ordinary capital resources and other resources that have been structured uh, by different entities um, of these institutions. So I'm going to stop here and open to questions. And apologies again for uh, the discussion with my, net, uh, with my network um, at, at the start. So I'm going to stop here and give the floor back to, to the moderator. Thank you. So thank you uh, for your presentation on uh, climate finance. So the pen panel discussions that we've had since the, this morning have amply borne out that uh, our planet is at risk and the challenges are enormous. Humanitarian crises and global suffering and climate-induced crises call for collective and collaborative actions. Uh, it calls for advocacy, developing understanding, taking interest, showing empathy, and changing attitudes and behavior, as well as mindset. And in this, education and science play a very important role. They are essential for uh, for uh, knowledge-based responses. So uh, I think um, climate finance is a critical subject, and this is important for enabling act actions and responses to climate change. The role of institutions is equally important, and such institutions as the South Center, ICCES, TWAS, and ICFS, and others have played a very important role in collaborating with uh, COMSAS that has, as everyone knows, 27 member countries, or, and also in seeing how triangular cooperation can be promoted. So with this, I think uh, if I'm allowed, I may just uh, pose a couple of questions uh, and then we can open it for others if they want to really uh, pose questions to the panelists. So uh, with respect to enabling climate change advocacy, uh, the question is, with diverse climate-related challenges and views within the global south, what kind of possibility would exist for a broad consensus on advocacy with the decision makers at the global level? Of course, excluding the one that is there in the Paris Agreement of the developed world taking the responsibility. So any one of the panelists, if they want to respond to this question. G? Uh, uh, Professor Lin, would you like to respond to this question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm sorry. Actually, I cannot hear clearly. Yeah, just uh, internet a little bit. Yeah, would you please? Yeah, repeat. Uh, essentially, this relates to the possibility of developing a broad consensus for advocacy that can be done with the decision makers at the global level. I think it's important for. Uh, for the countries of the South to develop an advocacy uh, strategy for taking up different issues with the developed world. So what can be done in developing a consensus on that? Yeah, in my understanding, one thing actually yeah, we can just, well, firstly, we just uh, link to you know, this diversity in flooding to the more extreme events. And this can be ascribed to the climate change. So in the general background, we can see we can need to yeah, reduce yeah, the emission and try to 
I think to 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 decrease, yeah, to to make the global warming mix lower. This is one of the yeah topics I think we can do. But another thing I think very very important issue is that whether we can make the prediction in maybe seasonal in months or seasonal one season in advance. So and this is another activities I think very very important. We need to uh, to develop uh, this kind of the disaster prediction system using the yeah, comprehensive or advanced modeling systems. We can climate models on atmospheric models, and then we can develop the sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction. And in that case, if that is the case, I think I would remember in the flooding this year in Pakistan, actually, I think in some of the dams are damaged, right? And then we can cause the inundation to different large areas. So actually, if we know can know that we do have a um, more extreme and uh, the more rainfalls, floodings in this year in several months, then we can take another, I think to take a lot of the measures to prevent, to mitigate or to, uh, I think it's try to reduce the risks. So I think in a several ways, a long way and a short, a short way. I think we can short term and long term, we also can need to work together. And then, and finally, I think we also need to, uh, to make a full monitoring Example for the data, you know, uh, for example, in, in Pakistan, I understand actually whether we can have a very yeah, dense the, yeah, yeah, monitoring system, observation system for uh, this meteorological or hydrological these conditions. You know, in, for example, in China, we have, I think, more than I think 20,000 or more than that observation networkings. But as, as I learned that in Pakistan, still for meteorological station, it's still very, very, I think, very sparse. And then in that case, if we have more yeah, data set, and also even we can do the in the cooperation, so we you know we can have more understand okay whether this this year's flooding how much percentage can be ascribed to you know, global warming, and how much percentage it can be ascribed to the you know, nature variability. You know we do have the nature variability year to year variation, even a decadal variation, and also we can also impose by the climate change. So a different signal. And they, they just yeah, convert together. So, by, by, so then the, 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 the attribution or ident identification of the visual source yeah, for this extreme flooding, I think it's very, very important for us. And then we can also can, for the monitoring and prediction facilities, is also very, very important. about uh, multilateral diplomacy. So given the wide ranging impact of climate change across borders, what important role could climate mitigation and adaptation action play regionally, keeping in view the ASEAN institutional framework as a model or any other successful African initiative as a possible model? So, uh, who is going to take this question? Can we uh, again request Professor Lin to uh, enlighten us on the subject? You mean, you mean how to, uh, for this, I'm, I'm not very really clear. Re about... re regionally, uh, mitigation and adaptation action, how, how regional cooperation would be leading to a more effective policy. And I think one is keeping in view the ASEAN institutional framework uh, or any other successful model that you might be having in mind. Uh, in my understanding, I mean, different countries, uh, different countries have different, I think, yeah, the background, I and mean, this is very important. So, uh, so, so whether we can get, I think, what, Actually, one of the yeah, very important is for uh, I think the clean energy. Right? So we have the hydropower or wind energy. This one issues. I think we can. Uh, I think uh, we will lead. I think we can to, to develop this kind of technologies. Uh, but another thing is actually for especially for developing countries. Uh, I think we have lack of these kinds of yeah, new technologies. So. Uh, what most important thing whether we can we can 
access to these new technologies and how in different countries work together from developed countries and all developing countries work together and we can I think we can get uh, more advanced or uh, tech techniques. And then this is kind of the uh, really important, I think the power, uh, you know, with every uh, developed country, developing countries, we need to have get more, I think then the emission or something for develop, to, to develop, uh, to get to increase the, the standard, the, 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 right? So for, for life, yeah, to, to improve the lives. So, but, but however, we also have a duty how to, yeah, to, to 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 reduce to to I think to make to, uh, to contribute yeah our yeah to the global yeah the the the, the emission reductions so I think the, the technology yeah, transfer is very important so this uh, I think a very important thing yeah we can, we need to I think I think this is uh, we need to the multilateral or multinational organization international organizations. Okay, so uh, I think one, I, I just wanted to find out if Mrs. Lee would be able to uh, give share her views on advocacy and uh, with the international organizations or the developed countries in getting more assistance in so far as climate uh, action is concerned. Uh, I personally think that uh, uh, it will be important uh, for the southern countries to for the developing countries uh, really to raise the issue of common and differentiated treatment uh, because as we uh, many of us mentioned just now uh, that the developing countries have been suffering unproportionately from the climate change so i think uh, it will be important to raise funds for the developing countries to cope with the challenges of climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, and also uh, it would be important for uh, different organizations, including COMSAS, uh, to uh, provide forum and platform like the meeting today uh, to discuss issues and also come to consensus. Uh, another aspect which is very important is to discuss about different kinds of financial instruments. Uh, for instance, uh, a debt climate change swap, debt relief climate change swap. There are various kinds of financial instruments that countries can uh, explore to alleviate their financial burdens in uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, of course, there have been some su successful cases uh, in the Caribbean, uh, which we can look into uh, and use that as uh, kind of case studies to advocate the use of different uh, financial instruments. So in some, I would think it will be important to reinforce uh, international discussion uh, among uh, developing countries, especially, and also uh, via triangular cooperation uh, to involve the major international stakeholders uh, like United Na Nations and also regional and multilateral banks. Uh, for instance, just now ISDB mentioned that ISDB has been very much involved in this. So it will be important to discuss among the multi-stakeholder kind of platform, like what we are having today, to discuss uh, about the most urgent issues and the policy recommendations uh, that uh, could uh, 
uh, uh, solve or mitigate the problems. Thank you. Uh, you so. Uh, I think it is related to investments, and usually the result, uh, the resulting re uh, returns are perhaps the best financial tool to help financial stability of any enterprise and initiative. How can development banks and other international financial institutions and funding age agencies improve community engagement? and financial mobility to develop climate resilience at all levels. I think you did mention about it briefly, but since this is a question, uh, perhaps you would like to elaborate it further. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mr. Um, Mr. Yusuf, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, I think that's actually a very um, useful question and very pertinent actually. Um, um, which was the point I actually mentioned earlier around the fact that it's one of the big challenges that we actually face is the fact that how do we actually help countries to be able to actually mobilize more resources? How do we help them to be able to actually get the needed framework um, in place to be able to actually capitalize on resources from using different instruments and, and, and modalities? Um, I'm going to give something very practical because I've, I tend to have worked in, in this particular space with quite a number of countries across the regions where we, we actually work. I think one fundamental thing is the fact that when you look at climate change discussions in public discourse in our countries, there's usually a very huge disconnect, a very huge disconnect between I think we'll come back to Mr. Yusuf because this is an important issue. So we'll come back as soon as our connection is established with, with you. But in the meantime, uh, this is uh, just something of interest to me. Uh, the Global Food Summit is taking place in New York. And earlier on, the foreign ministers held a meeting on uh, global food uh, security. So the question uh, that I would like to see clarification from uh, Mr. Muta, Mutualu, Manafi, Mr. Manafi, that is your organization, what kind of uh, collaboration is there with those who are organizing the summit and what kind of input or uh, collaboration can there be in uh, the, within the framework of uh, Global Food Security Summit or the organizers? Um, Madam Moderator, yes, yes, yes Madam. Madam Madre, thank you very much for this pertinent, important question. Um, as you know very well, the Islamic Organization of Food Security is a specialized institution of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Um, we are a fairly new institution, uh, and so um, there are some issues that uh, we have to ensure I, that are taken care by our mother organization, which is the YC. So currently at the UNGA, uh, the Secretary General of OIC and the main office uh, staff are there. And we understand that the, the position of, uh, of in the Muslim world with regards to food security at the summit that, that you just alluded are being somehow uh, you know, uh, taken care by, by them. 
Uh, of course, we are part of the UN OSC coordination mechanism. Uh, we had we were we attended a meeting uh, last July with other uh, you know uh, sister uh, specialized agencies of United Nations that are active in the field of food security. So uh, just for your for your information, in fact, we in 2024 the US will be holding the same exercise UN UN OSC coordination meeting here in Astana. Uh, so yes, uh, we are following up. The, the summit, uh, our partners are there. We are very much eager to receive uh, very soon the outcomes to see how those can be incorporated in our, uh, uh, you know, strategies. As you, may, as you, as I alluded in my uh, presentation, next month we have our fifth general assembly, where we expect some, some, uh, some, some, some uh, improvements in the strategy that IFS is is, is implementing for ensuring food security and agriculture development in its member states. Yes, and as far as the uh, cooperation is concerned, um, um, you may know that uh, last week, I, uh, Dr. Ismail and I were in the, in the headquarters of Comsats, and we discussed lots of issues that I have to do exactly with the, with the market related with smart agriculture in the, in with, that uh, will incorporate factors related with green revolution food security, climate change, and digitalization. These four factors are where we see the cooperation with Comsats. And we understand that, um, that the draft memorandum of understanding that was sent uh, will be have to be reviewed accordingly and with some ideas. And uh, I'm 100% sure that uh, the, the cooperation between uh, uh, IFS and Comsat uh, will, will be very fruitful uh, in near future for common member states. I don't know, Madam Moderator, if I have addressed your important question. Thank you. The OIC essentially is going to take care of it in New York. You have provided your input and thank you for visiting Pakistan and interacting with different organizations here uh, in this uh, situation where we have uh, floods and uh, a difficult situation that Pakistan is confronting right now. So if Mr. Yusuf would like to continue with his uh, uh, explanation, response to the question. Yes, um, th th thank you so much, um, Madam Moderator. Sincere apologies, um, colleagues. Um, I've, I've had to switch onto my mobile now. I think I was probably, well, probably having some network issues um, within the floor. Apologies, please. Um, so the, the point I was, I was, I was uh, emphasizing earlier was around the fact that the disconnect between the budgetary uh, process and the priority that is usually given when it comes to uh, financiers reaching out to government as to the key areas that they would want us to actually engage, right? Often the challenge we face is the fact that there's that disconnect between the ministries that are typically involved in climate change issues and the ministry that eventually get to talk to us as financiers. So you, the typical ministries that will talk to us will be Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Finance, but then the ministries that talk about climate change are probably the Ministry of Environment, um, um, uh, Ministries of Climate Change or Department of Climate Change. So that disconnect actually creates a lot of problems when it comes to getting the right type of investment for climate action in many countries. That's one. The other aspect is around the capacity. Uh, I'm sure this, this is exactly not new, that most times MDBs will always talk about the fact that we always find it difficult to get those bankable projects. There are a whole lot of instruments and modalities that can be used out there from public to private sector finances. The challenge is usually that how bankable are those projects? Bankable in the sense that are those projects actually fit for the purpose for which they are being proposed? So when there is also that challenge, and one of the areas that the bank uh, and all MDBs, by the way, we've been trying to actually help address this, is the fact that we have this central coordinating mechanism in country where we don't just talk to the Ministry of Finance. We don't just talk to the Ministry of uh, Planning. Now we say Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Finance. Can you bring the various ministries, including energy, including water, sanitation, agriculture, climate change, environment, bring all of them together whenever we have our country. And with this, we've been able to see a lot of uh, reduction in that disconnect where now the ministers of finance, they're talking about issues around green finance. They're talking about, um, um, uh, um, what's it called, green bonds. They're talking about, those elements that we typically not have had um, 20, 15 years ago. But now because of that strong centralized coordination mechanism in country, we're able to see many of those. And these are the things that we eventually trickle down to the community level. 
because the moment as financiers, we do not just go directly to the communities. We start from the national and then it gets trickled out. And we've been able to see that this coordination mechanism, they've been able to help. The other aspect is around the sort of bankable, the bankability of project and, and proposals that we typically get from country. One of the ways in which MDBs have been able to play a very crucial role in that is actually to see how we can actually provide uh, our project preparation facilities. Um, for instance, there are projects that we get um, requests to see how we can actually help develop them. And recently in the bank, we've been able to continually give that preference to projects that will feel that they have a lot of strong climate co-benefits. For instance, if you know that the project would have a lot of benefits, not just for development, like I mentioned in my presentation, but that project would also have a lot of benefit for climate. So we typically have a rating system that gives preference for those type of projects because we feel that the benefit is much more than just uh, providing access to water or access to energy, but access to clean energy, but access to more water efficient technology and things like that. So that, that, with that, with the capacity building, with the prioritization mechanisms that we have in, in, in our institutions, we've been able to actually see ways in, in, in which um, we've been able to actually reduce that order um, that comes with having less um, 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 bankable plan. One last thing that I want to talk about is the fact that uh, the, the solution to climate action is not one way solution. Multiple solutions are needed. The same way we talk about multiple technologies that will be needed for climate action, whether it's the drive for long-term um, 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 decarbonization of countries or getting to next zero or building a resilient system, whether it's agriculture, water. It's exactly the same way the financial solutions are actually multiple. There are multiple. We've seen instances where in the bank we've done crowdfunding platform where the platform was not ours. It was in Uganda and in Nigeria, but we just provided first loss loss tranche where the first uh, like about two million dollars specifically to ensure that if there are any losses that happens at the first stage because these are new guys just coming into the market those responsibility becomes our own loss it's part of the ways in which we help to de-risk those places where people would typically not want to invest so we're able to crowd in more resources by the fact that people saw that we're putting grant money in the tune of about two million dollars just to help de-risk that particular sector. So these are some of the instruments that we as MDBs will continue to play. The advantage that we have as MDBs, which is you, you will typically not find in commercial banks. Commercial banks do not take risk. We are public banks. We are owned by, by the public. We are owned by the government. We are owned by citizens. Everyone in this call, you have shares in all MDBs, right? So because the banks belong to the people, and this is why we can actually take some level of risk that you typically not find in commercial or private private banks. And this is one of the roles that we continue to play. That's why you can find us in very risky places that you typically not find commercial banks. And the earlier that countries, uh, those that are involved in climate change discussions, they understand that is a mix. It's not just private sector, it's not just public, but a mix of these different um, um, in instruments and these different uh, um, 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 uh, policy tools that can actually help to actualize the overall goal of helping to drive um, our economies to becoming more climate resilient, to becoming more robust, and, and, and drive towards, uh, towards a much greener economy. I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Uh, each state has to develop an integrated uh, approach in so far as climate finance is concerned. And the, uh, I think it's important to do that. Uh, bankability of projects is another issue where I think we need a lot of uh, training and perhaps organizing workshops to make people capable and understand how this is to be achieved. Thank you very much. And uh, I think I'll hand over to Omar. Thank you very much. Um, so the next speaker is Omar Ali. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Kumar Bhosh. I'm from Comsha Shikhi Deke, Director Programs. Uh, I'm here to give you my complete remarks for the event. Uh, uh, let me start by thanking all the speakers for their excellent, uh, thought provoking uh, uh, talks. The moderator, Ambassador Fozia, for adding such richness and depth to the uh, today's discussion, and all participants for attending this webinar. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, today's discussion has not only provided us uh, with a wealth of information, uh, but also a strong foundation upon which to build a general recommendation on the South South Cooperation for Climate Diplomacy, which we hope all will contribute to identifying and forming a common position among the 
uh, developing country, and the member countries of a uh, concept uh, commission in the south, um, at various international platforms such as uh, uh, UNFCCC conference of parties. Uh, we have heard from uh, distinguished speakers about innovating the South South uh, Cooperation for Climate Action, uh, current tendency in the South South Cooperation, highlighting how South South Cooperation offers solution or a key to helping uh, developing countries build collective resilience and uh, uh, more sustainable development. In particular, some uh, pointed about uh, the essential role of education and awareness reason in increasing adaptation and mitigation capacity at the community level. Uh, South South Cooperation uh, has always existed, but in uh, the recent times, it has become more legitimized, formalized, and recognized. Uh, we at the uh, Comsa Secretariat and the Comsa Center for Climate and Sustainability are very happy to be at the service to our member uh, centers, uh, member centers of uh, International Science and Technology Centers of Excellence, as well as the members of the Comsa uh, Center for Climate and Sustainability, by providing a, a platform like this for establishing a dialogue and expert network that we are convinced are useful for our uh, all members. Uh, let me wish all of us a lot of energy, uh, shared trust, and a resolve on our way towards achieving a better future for all. Together we can make it uh, happen. Concluding with the pledge, never to rest until we have achieved a world with uh, sustainable resources for all. Uh, thank you so much for uh, attending the webinar and have a pleasure in the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, can we have a group photo? You may please all turn on your camera so we forgot to have a group photo. Ah, uh, yes. Let's go for group photo. Professor Lin, I enjoyed your talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a tidy. <laughs> A long time, let's see. Yeah, so you don't have a meeting. <laughs> yeah, I was listening. Mm, thank you. Uh, so, like, from all of us from Comsa Secretariat, Dr. Jinegari. How are you, Professor Lane? Hello. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, it's just great. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. The yeah, you are, thank you. And thank Yusuf, you. how are you? <laughs> Hope next year we can have a meeting, um, come some meeting, eh? <laughs> we can be together. May I request you one once again, please? Sir. Uma and Saf, very well done. Shabash, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm doing well. Brother so Yusuf, <laughs> Brother Yusuf <laughs> if you can uh, send me your email, I would like to continue the conversation for the IFS ISDB cooperation, please. Excellent. That, that's fine with me. Thank you. If if you can put the, your email in the chat, just directly to me, I would appreciate. Yes, sir. How are you? You want everybody to put on his camera. Mm -hmm. Please put on your cameras so that we can take your picture. Eh? Is that right? <laughs> oh, Madam, you are still here? Also. Farhan, where are you? Farhan, where are you? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> You are there. Yes, sir. 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 Yes,
can we apply the formula of sustainable development in pakistan can't you hear nahi hum mujhe keh rahe hain i think you basically this is a question addressed to all the parents yes to all i am telling them especially the people in the comsat secretariat that can we apply the formula of sustainable development in the present situation in pakistan if we could apply the sustainable development techniques in pakistan probably we will be better off रिहेबिलिटेशन I think uh, we should move in a sustainable. Hey, Dr. Uma, can we call it today? Yes, Professor. Can we call it today? <laughs> Thank you so okay, much. Okay, God bless you all. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Have a pleasure, Dr. Uma.